Welcome to week eight, day one. This is our only live lecture this week. The other, uh, let's this over here. Um, the other two days we will be uh, doing pre-recorded lectures this week. As I'm going to Rhode Island, I'm going to the SIG CSC conference. I was given a grant by the conference to go out there. They help pay my travel expenses and the school is kicking in some money also. So I'm going to go to Providence, Rhode Island and attend a conference and learn how to become a computer science professor. So when I come back, hopefully I'll be a computer science professor then. Okay. No stream. Oh dear. Okay. Well, nothing's really important yet. There we go. So uh, there are a couple announcements to make. Uh, first of all, classes CE take three is up. Linked list CE take one is up. I extended the deadline, here's the big one, I extended the deadline on EU4 to tomorrow because the student asked for an extension, I granted it, and then I was like, if I have to do it for one person, I have to do it for everybody. I don't like granting extensions, um, especially if you do it too often, then students just come to expect it. And then when you don't, they get crushed but with the F, you know, so um, that said, uh, I think that the lecture from Friday was actually probably pretty pretty helpful. So you have until noon tomorrow, Tuesday, not Wednesday, because I'm going to be in the air on Wednesday. So you have till tomorrow to finish EU4. Um, if you have any questions about that, uh, please let me know. You have until Friday to finish uh, Bridges Earthquakes. It is uh, not a hard assignment. Uh, everybody should be able to um, knock that out pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Um, if, if you're confused on something on it, please ask for help um, today or tomorrow while I'm still here because I'm going to be at a conference and um, I'm not going to be in front of a computer. It's, we'll, we'll see if I ha how much you know time I have to actually help you guys for that. Uh, Mink Rayleigh is always around, of course. He's, he's, a, he's really the, the hero of this class. Let me tell you how hard that guy works and Bedencourt as well. They're... they're I don't know. You, guys, you guys are really honestly very, very lucky to have them helping you out. So, um, uh, will the lectures uh, be uploaded? I can just put them up now, I guess. Um, I mean, no reason to wait, you know. I, I could premiere them on the respective days, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. much, much uh, appreciation for the TAs in this class. All right. So, our topic for today is. Um, is binary search trees. So we're gonna learn a brand new data structure today. Uh, before we do that though, I kinda wanna go a little bit more in detail on um, Big O. Okay, so if we uh, let's do a few examples on Big O, let's just see if we can build some intuition on this. Uh, let's see. And we'll read, please enter a size. Thank you. Uh, vector of integers, name vec of size n, all of which are initialized 42. Okay. Let's see out vector square bracket i. So, how many times is it going to print an element of vec? What is what is the big O? This is big O what? Order what? How many? How many operations is this going to run? And, and remember when we say number of operations, it's not like an exact number, right? Like, um, you know, like when you output a number and you're also outputting an inline, like maybe that's, maybe that's three operations, I, you know, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is that it's a constant amount of time, right? So when you output a number, you know, when you output vector i, it doesn't matter how big vector is, right? It just, it's an order one operation, right? So. Every time you output vector i like this, it takes a constant amount of time. Whatever amount, it's going to be a small amount of time, but it's not. It's not like one line of assembly, right? There's probably going to be some conversion from a number to characters. Um, the end line itself is going to echo a new line to the screen, and it'll do a see out flush that flushes a buffer. There's actually a lot of things going on here, but what matters is it is that it's a constant amount of time. When you, when you see out vector i, 
it doesn't matter if you have a million elements in it, a billion elements in it, or 20, right? It just takes a constant amount of time. And that's what we call order one. Order one means constant running time. And this loop runs n times, right? It's a standard for loop. This loop runs n times. And so n times, we do one work. n times one is n. So this is a order, this is an order in algorithm. Move the mouse out of the way. All right, how many times does this loop run? So the outer loop runs n times, and each time the outer loop runs, it runs this n times, and each time that one runs, it does an order one operation, printing a vector to the screen. So uh, uh, yeah, when you when you do this, this is going to create a vector of size n, and it will initialize every element to 42. Why? I don't know. I like 42. Um, so that's 42, 42. All right. So <laughs> 42 seemed odd. Yeah, it's it's uh, the answer to the life, the universe, and everything. So it's the Douglas Adams thing. Uh, and for whatever reason, like 42 has come up a lot in my life. Um, the last time I went to Yosemite, I was randomly assigned a, a, a campsite, and the campsite was 42. I went to a food truck the other day, and, they, and my order number was 42. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's just there's a psychological thing that, like, when you pay attention to things, you tend to see it more. But I don't know. So uh, data mining. <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is going to run in squared times. Time to make CSI 42. Oh, yeah. Good one. Uh, what happened when I turned 42? I'm 44 now. Oh, the pandemic started. <laughs> I, I turned 42, and then, yeah, that was the exact start of the pandemic. So, you know. <laughs> really, yeah. Yeah. All right, so, yeah, true story. Cursed birthday. Kearney's the main character. <laughs> It was all a warning from God all along. Yeah. Okay. So this is in squared. What about um, this one? Correlation equals cause. Yeah, I mean, sure, it's a fallacy, but it, it was. Oh, where's my boba? I don't have my boba with me. What's the running time of this? Code, code equals seg fault. Yeah, this is order in cubed. That is correct. And we could keep going with this and you know make it order into the tenth power or whatever. Basically, when when you have nested for loops like this, um, you just count how many times it's nested, and that is the uh, exponent over the n. So this is in cube. Uh, yeah, into the fourth power now, right? Okay. Does this make sense, everybody? All right, well, let's let's mix it up a little bit. Let's mix it up a little bit. Okay. So what's the running time of this? On. <laughs> Order it, yeah, okay. What's the running time of this? I like them. <laughs> I don't want to type that five times. Heck no. So, um, do you see the difference between like a nested for loop and like parallel for loops? All right. This is not order uh, into the fifth. No, because they're not nested, right? Because when they're nested, it says for each time, run the inner loop n times. And then for each one of those, run the inner loop n times. So it's n times n. This is n plus n. So this is n plus n, you know, or 5n, right? Now, when working with, uh, uh, a good way to do this is to count the for loops, yeah. But you, you count the nested level, right? Order in, this is order in, right? And then we do order in, then we do order in, then we do order in, then we do order in. So this is 5n. But in computer science, we don't care about trivial, trivial details like 5. No, we don't care about 5. What we care about is the shape, the, the shape of the line. So as the vector gets bigger, 
this code here, the running time moves up in a linear fashion. Okay, so this is called a linear uh, linear relationship or a linear algorithm. Okay, because the uh, the slope we actually don't care about the slope honestly. All right. Um, so um, while loops are the same as for loops. Um, What is the running time of this? Order in? <laughs> yeah? Order in? <laughs> this is order infinite. <laughs> the absolute worst running time possible. It is a forever loop. Okay, order infinity, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the nice things about a for loop is you can just kind of eyeball it and be like, yep, that's running n times, right? With a while loop, you have to like be like, okay, is there a break somewhere within there? What's the variable initialized to? It, it takes a little bit more thinking, but essentially a while loop and a for loop are the same thing. Uh, for example, I could write a, a for loop, right? Does the same thing, that's literally the same thing as while true right there. Have, has it, have any of you seen this before? For semicolon, semicolon? I wonder if programs are running with an infinite loop to this day. Most, uh, you know, like probably most professional programs are actually an infinite loop, right? If you think about it, your, your video game should run forever, right? And then there's code inside of it that says if the user selects quit, then, then quit out, right? So, um, Probably, probably, yeah, I'd say most programs actually run with an infinite loop in them with some ability for the user to hit quit or something, close the X out of it, you know, click on one of these things here. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, while true. Uh, this is the same thing as while true. Some people write like writing this. Um, this is personal preference. Same thing, infinite loop. Okay, so, uh, yeah, what about this one? What is the running time of this beautiful code here? couple different things going on, right? Yes, you can't just like, you know, when I said you have to count the for loops, I don't mean just like sit there and go one, two. Like, no, what, what, I, what I mean by you have to count the for loops is you have to look at the uh, number of levels of nesting of the for loops, right? Parallel for loops don't really matter. Uh, five in doesn't matter because you're talking about the difference between a million and five million, who cares? Whereas when you're talking about the difference between uh, if n is a million for n cubed, which this is, this is an n cubed, order n cubed, you're talking about uh, a million times a million times a million, so that is a trillion million. So this this code here for n is equal to a million will run a trillion million times. This will run four million times. So we actually don't care. Like we could write this like this. We could say this is order n cubed plus four n. We we could write that if we wanted, but we don't care. And the reason why we don't care is because this n cubed is a trillion million. Nobody cares about a trillion and four million, you know, <laughs> like at the point where you have a trillion million operations going on, a trillion and four literally doesn't matter in the slightest. It gets completely overwhelmed by the n cubed factor. And so we just write it like that. Whenever we work with big O, we only care about the biggest term. Okay. We only care about the biggest term. So you could write four n plus n cubed if you really, really wanted to be, I don't know pedantic or something, um, but in, in all honesty, no, nobody nobody does that. Um, it, it's just the biggest term is what matters because like that's what's, you're, you're gonna spend all of your time here. You know, you're not spending your time up here. Like very little time spent up here, almost all your time is gonna be spent down here. So this is an order n cubed algorithm. Only care about the highest degree of big O. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, um, all right. 
let's talk about sort. That's kind of important. Sort vec.begin, vec.end. Sort is order in log n. So if you were going to sort random data, you cannot do better than order n log n. So if you are sorting a million numbers, it will take roughly 20 million operations. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, log is actually almost free. Not quite, but if you want to think of it as like almost free. If you have like um, a phone book search, right? And uh, is order log in, right? If you, if you have a sorted, uh, uh, vector of strings. You can find any name in a million uh, strings by going halfway to the middle and then seeing you know which way the name is, like we did this last time I think with Otal's name, right? And then you go halfway and then you go halfway, then you go halfway, then you go halfway, you go halfway. And so in a million names you could find any name in 20 steps or less. It's not one step, it's not constant running time, but it's pretty good. And um, so in computer science, order log in is usually good enough. Like, it's actually, you know, if you can get your algorithm down to log in, you're, yeah, you just go like, yeah, I'm done. You know, it's good enough. It's fast. It's, it, you know, it's fast, right? Log in is, is fast. It's the opposite of exponentiation. Exponentiation, uh, order two to the n, right? So the bad kids club, right? Would be uh, order, you know, infinite obviously order in factorial somebody was asking about an example of an in factorial i think last time i said if you just randomly shuffle a deck if you try every shuffle of a deck of cards to, to count how many of how many uh shuffles have three threes in a row that would be an order in factorial algorithm it's really bad uh also bad would be order two to the n um this these these guys here are just um and order in is kind of a joke so let's do that uh, it's we, we call these like intractable problems. Unsolvable for any large-ish n. And by large-ish, I mean like just by like 100. 2 to the 100th power is just an un, unimaginably large number, right? Uh, it's like, yeah, try every combination of streets, you know, to, to find the shortest path the order two to the n. And so you can't do that. Uh, basically, if you have an order two to the n algorithm, you might be able to work for 10, 15, you know, but uh, for anything bigger than that, it's just unsolvable, okay? And then the, uh, the kind of like, okay-ish would be like order n, order n squared sometimes, like uh, those are kind of like, you know, throw enough processing power at it and you'll be fine you know, kind of things. If you have to, you have to, you know, nobody's, nobody's happy about order, you know, into the third power. Like you start getting into like unhappy face, you know, squared is kind of like, uh, eh, eh. and then order in is usually pretty, yeah, it's usually pretty good. You know, oftentimes, oftentimes like when you're given data, you have to like process the data, right? Like if somebody gives you like a bunch of names to average together or whatever, like you got to process them all, right? And so if your algorithm is order n, like you, you can't really be faster than that because at a certain level, you just got to read all the data in, you know what I mean? Like you got to, you got to read the data. And so order n is like, you know, I mean, you got to touch it all once anyway. You might as well just do your calculations as you go along or something. Order n is usually pretty good. Um, order n squared. Yeah, it's the kind of thing where if you're Google, you're, they, they just are like, buy another computer, <laughs> buy another data center, you know, and throw, throw the data center at the problem. Ordering cubed, you're kind of getting into the unhappy face territory, but it's still, you know, if it's, it's, if it's an important algorithm, you, you, uh, you know, purchase more data centers and throw them at the problem and it'll solve it eventually, you know, money makes the world go around or whatever. So, um, uh, yeah, if you want to check the running time of your code, you, you, uh, you can either do it inside of your code itself by using chrono, or you can use ctime, uh, or you can just run your executable. 
via uh, something like this, so g plus plus main.cc, time a dot out, please enter size, one million. So sorting one million integers took about a quarter second. Okay. Uh, if we do one, let's do five thousand million. So doing five million, so five times 0.24, uh, yeah, a little bit worse than linear, right? Because it's an n log n. Let's do 10 million. Ah, oh, shoot. Time made out out. 10 million. So, yeah, see, it's a little bit worse than twice as slow. You see that? For 5 million, it's 0.12 seconds. For 10 million, it's 0.26 seconds. So it's a little bit worse than twice, right? So sorting is, you know, sorting is n log n. That's probably, that's something you should probably memorize, okay? So, um, five trillion, please, no, I'm, I'm all right. So, yeah, so that's something just every computer scientist knows. Uh, the, the running time of sort is in login. And it's the most common um, factoid people will know. Oh, what was the name of it? It's linear, linear, rhythmic, linear, 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 Lin arithmetic, yeah, okay. CPP reference sort. And so every time you come into like CPP reference, you can always look at the complexity. That's the running time, that's big O, right? So uh, basically every algorithm, every data structure operation will tell you the running time of it in terms of big O, okay? And so this one is in login. And uh, and if you were to do like, I don't know, vector erase, uh, vector erase, complexity, linear. Sometimes, sometimes they use big O notation and sometimes they just use a word like linear, exponential, constant running time, things like that. So uh, erase for a vector, of course, you know, if you, if you erase the first element, it's got to move everybody to the left. And so it's a linear uh, order, order in, right? Press pushback. Let's see, clear the contents. Uh, whereas pushback is a little bit interesting. It's gonna be amortized constant running time. So I, I've been telling you that pushback is order one, but it's not, it's order n, one out of n times. And so on average, it is constant running time. So if you do 100 pushbacks, it'll average to 100 operations, so to speak. But um, every so often, pushback will trigger a reallocation. When the vector runs out of room, it makes a new vector, has to copy all the elements over. That's an order in operation. It's got to copy all the elements over, throws the old one away, and then does the pushback. So most of the time, a pushback just writes the value into the end. But when it runs out of room, it triggers a reallocate. So every so often, one out of n times, it will do n work. And so that's called amortized constant, not constant. It just means on average, n divided by n is one, right? It averages out to constant running time, but it's not always. And so this can be a problem if you're like making a video game, right? If you're, uh, if you trigger a reallocate on a large vector in the middle of like your game running, like the game will hitch, like the game will be going 60 frames, 60 frames, 60 frames. Oh, I'm Elden Ring. Oh, it's one, one frame a second, one frame a second. And then it goes back to 60 frames a second. Uh, Elden Ring, it's doing that because it's compiling shaders in the middle of the game, which is uh, yeah. not the best uh, <laughs> game development in the world, but yeah, it's a beautiful game, so whatever. Okay, right. uh, is there a set size where it happens? Uh, it's, it's um, if you remember, uh, there's a command called vec.reserve, and that tells you the secret size of the vector is now at least 100,000. So, so if you want to tell it to secretly allocate more memory so you don't have to trigger reallocations as often, vector.reserve is the way to go. It can ignore you, by the way. Uh, it can make it 200,000 if, if it wants. So, um, it, it, but it will guarantee that at least 100,000 spots are available in the vector. Okay, um, fun game, yeah. Uh, not good at it, though. I am not good at it. All right, so yeah, login. Okay, so 
yeah, if you want to put an English or a uh, emoji on these uh, big O things, uh, order in factorial, order two to the N are, ah, no, horrible. Uh, the linear and quadratic options and cubic are kind of like, you know, they're not great for games. You know, if you got a million things in the world, you don't want to have to do something on all million of them every frame. That will slow your game down. However, uh, login is usually pretty good. For example, if, uh, if you want to shoot a gun and you want to draw a line through your world and see what you hit, you want to be able to do that in order login time. And that's kind of what RTX on was about. So that, that data structure that we made it in it accelerates that exact thing. You shoot, a, you shoot a line and it tells you very quickly in order login time what box you hit. And that's good enough. Uh, if, you, if you have a million boxes in the world, you click trigger and it can find the box that you hit in 20 steps or less, that's good enough. It's fast enough for a video game. Okay. Uh, how would you fix the issue of compiling shaders in the midst of combat and Elden Ring? Abstractly, that is. What you have to do is... Um, you have to compile the shaders at load time, basically. And so if you've ever played a game that has like a half hour long load time or something like that, guess what it's doing? And one of the problems, one of the reasons why they don't have them all pre-calculated is because when you change your graphic settings, when you change the pipeline, uh, the shaders don't match anymore. And so sometimes it just has to recompile a shader on the fly, and that's when the frame rate dips to one as it's doing it. Um, clever game, you know, it's probably something they'll patch out. They'll probably figure out, okay, this thing's coming up, start compiling it now before we need it. Um, Cyberpunk would just not draw things in the world until the shaders were compiled. And so you'd be driving along and like people would just be boop, just boop. And sometimes their uh, sunglasses would appear after they're there and then suddenly it's like, boop, they have sunglasses on. And, you know, they just don't draw the things that the shaders aren't ready for. So it has great frame rate, but just things will just kind of teleport in. You know, randomly. Cyberpunk glitches were so much fun. Yeah, my daughter was upset when they fixed them. She's like, no, Daddy, tell them not to fix the bugs. They're the best part of the game. <laughs> we would literally watch YouTube videos of just bugs of Cyberpunk uh, last Christmas. And uh, <laughs> people T-posing on the motorcycles and things like that. Like, she laughed so hard, like, snot was coming out of her face and stuff. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, order login is the Good Kids Club. Uh, good Kids Club is the order login and order one, right? So order one is the tops. Uh, if you have an order one operation, then you love it, keep it, don't lose it. And it's kind of your job, you know, as a computer scientist, it's your job to not only be able to look at your code and tell what the order running time of your code is, but also to think about it and go like, is there a better way? Okay. And so let me give you an example from real life. Um, okay. So we'll do this while true. Uh, good enough. Uh, vec dot push back. Um, read an integer if back dot back zero brick. All right, so this code here is gonna keep reading integers from the keyboard until um, they type zero, okay? What is the running time of this? <coughs> How many times is it gonna run? How many, count the loops. How many times is it going to loop? Constant. Constant? Always going to be five? Seven? Depends on the user input. Yeah. So we, we would describe this as order n, right? Uh, where n is the number of hints. Enter. Okay. So this is an order n algorithm. All right. Now, uh, let me show you, I was working for um, a person who was a programmer, but not like computer science programmer. He had been trained in another discipline. And he did something like this. So he would read an integer in, and then he would call sort.
What's the running time of this now? He had a, he had a rule. He had an invariant that the the array always had to be sorted. So, what's the running time of this? The whole thing. The whole loop. We're going to read in n integers. And every time we read an integer in, we sort the entire vector. So, still in here? Hmm. This is order and log n, right? So n times, this part here is order 1. So who cares, right? Um, but n times, we do n log n work. So what is n times n log n? n squared, n squared log n, n log n squared, yeah, n squared log n. So this is now order n squared log n. Okay. And so um, just to make things worse, let's say that he was actually using bubble sort and was actually doing an n squared sort every time. What's the running time of it now? Let's say that he was doing bubble sort or selection sort. Because there are bad sort algorithms that are order n squared. Uh, we teach them in CSI 40 just to give people practice, but you really shouldn't do them. And in fact, I kind of don't like teaching them because then people will, will, will write them and use them. And order n squared is way, way worse than order n log n. Right? If you're sorting a million numbers, n squared is a million million. n log n is 20 million. So it's 50,000 times faster to use the standard library sort rather than writing your own. Yeah, yeah so this is n cubed now. Very good. It's an n cubed algorithm now. So what did I do when I came in and looked at this? First thing, um, the first thing I did was I didn't understand that he needed it to be sorted. So I just kind of did, I kind of did that and took it from order n cubed to order n which turned out to be one optimization too far. He, he, he explained to me later after I, I worked on it for a week, I, I basically took his code. He, he was hiring me to port his code from C++ to C. So I took his code, went home, rewrote it, sent it to him. And he's like, no, 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 is, it needs to be sorted. And he explained all this math stuff to me and my, I, I'm like, oh, okay, all right, I believe. You. All right. So, um, yeah, so I took it down to order n. It was, too much, too much optimization. Now it's your job, like I said, as a computer scientist to like look at this code and be like, all right, how can I make it better? Like an obvious step would be to replace bubble sort with quick sort or whatever the standard library sort is, right? So that would take it from order in cubed to order in squared log n. But what else can we do here? Is there, is there something else we can do to drop the class of of the of the running time, right? Because every time you take a step down the chain here, you're getting huge speed increases, right? Going from order two to the n, to order in cubed, to order in squared, to order n, to log n, to one. Each one of those steps represents a mammoth, mammoth gain in performance, right? Like if you could just go from like order in squared to order n, for a million numbers, that's a million times faster, right? And same thing, going from order in cubed to order in squared, that's a million times faster. It's, it's you know, the choice of algorithm is, is really important. So define mathematics and sort it after. Yeah, that's actually what I did. So basically I just did this, bloop, to bloop, right? Read all the data first, then sort it. Right, makes sense. It doesn't need to be sorted while you're reading the data, just read all in, then sort it. And so this dropped it from order in squared login to order in login, okay? And so, the code went from like a million, it would go a million, million, so million. Uh, so the, the, co the code's running time went from a trillion million to 20 million. It's a lot faster, <laughs> right? Do, do you understand my point here? Like if you, can, if you can look at your loops and change the algorithm so it drops it one of these categories, uh, yeah, you're talking just incredible speed differences for any size that matters, right? So a trillion million to 20 million. 
I got him in, uh, like, what is that, 50 billion times faster? Yeah. It's pretty impressive. The frame rate went up quite a lot. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and, so that, and that's one of the reasons why we're computer science majors, because we understand these things. Like, Big O is part of being a computer science major, understanding running time at, at this sort of high level, because if you can just tick it down one of those notches, man, it makes a huge difference. And that's what separates computer scientists from, like, programmers. Like, programmers know how to write code, but oftentimes they make decisions, like the guy that I was working for, I thought, uh, was a very smart guy. But they just make bad decisions because they don't understand big O and complexity and things like that. Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, and, and we could use a different structure. In fact, the structure, if it needs to always be sorted, is the structure we're going to learn today. So, uh, what we're going to do today is learn a new data structure. That data structure is called set. And need you, don't need you, I'll just leave y'all down here. dst.insert read int and insert so the set class is uh, implemented usually as a binary search tree. Yep. And uh, map and set are both related. And you, by the way, you have the Zybooks up right now, and it's going to go over all of the data structures for this class. This week's Zybooks is really important. It goes over every topic that is required for this class. Like nationwide, the ACM has guidelines on what should be taught in a first year data structures class. And this is a big one. Okay, and the Zybooks goes over each of the most important data structures for this class this week. It's really important too. Got some labs on it, um, but uh, it's it's you should really make sure you do this one. What's BSD? I'll, I'll I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I, for now, it's just the name. It, I'm making a set called BST. It's the Beast, Mr. Beast. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read an integer. If they type in zero, I break. Otherwise, I add it to the data structure, and then I'm just going to like. Print it all out for every integer in the BST. See how that integer. Call it a day, and let's do this. So, uh, error set was not declared. That's a fair criticism. Okay. Uh, they're not in queue anymore. It is a binary search tree. That's that's our topic for today. So we're going to type in 10 and negative 10 and 50 and 20 and negative 1,000 and 999 and 9,000. Now, when it prints it out, note that everything comes out sorted. So set is a cool data structure. I like it a lot. I don't use it that often. I use hash tables more often, but it's got a really nice property. So let's let, let me give you the high level introduction to set. It has order login, insertion, search, and delete. Bonus, always sorted. So if that guy had been working for had known about this data structure, uh, he probably just would have used it, right? Because he kept adding things to a vector and then resorting it, and then adding things and resorting it. A set is always sorted. Always. Can't unsort it. You can't call sort on it. Sort won't work on it because it's always sorted. So you can add things to the set like this. This is how you add things. Insert. Use a function called insert. Uh, if you want to delete from it, uh, int to be deleted is equal to read int. Uh, don't need to. Uh, please enter a number to be deleted. And then we can call bst.erase. Okay. That'll delete it from the set. So basically with a set, things are either in a set or they're on a set. You can't have duplicates. If you add 30 multiple times to the set, it just it's in the set already. Okay, cool. If you erase it, it's gone. Okay. And then um, 
is enter a number to search for. And we can call bst.count. Seer, search. I don't know. You only have one of each number. Yes. If you want to have, if you want to allow duplicates, there is a version of the set called multi-set, and multi-set will allow you to insert things multiple times. And sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. It just depends what you need. So uh, for now, we'll just start with set, and uh, it's it's a nice data structure because login, like I said, is fast. For every doubling of the problem size, you only have to do one more step, right? So like if we had a, a for loop like this, for int i equals zero, i is less than n, i plus plus, c out vector i. Let's go back to having a vector again, vector events named back of size 100, something, whatever. Um, what's the big old running time of this? this is order one. <laughs> this is an order one algorithm. <laughs> uh, technically fixed. Now, it's, yeah. Uh, it's fixed. It was a fixed running time. All right, now it's order in. Now it's order in. Okay. Bit of a trick question for you. So uh, it's a set number, yeah. It, it always runs a hundred times. It's a constant running time. Okay. Now it's now it's order in. Now let me let me mix it up for you. What is the running time of this algorithm? What about the while loop? Uh, we're not just we're just talking about this right now. I changed something. It's not i plus plus anymore. It's i equals i times two. There is no order in over half. Remember, constants don't matter. One half times in, five times in, we don't care. Five million, one million, ten million, it's all the same. We don't care. It's like uh, it's like how the federal government handles money, right? As long as the as long as you're you know, you do your you know, your audit over the Pentagon and the numbers come in with like a billion or so, you're like, ah, it's accurate. <laughs> the Federal Reserve, like, they just round to the nearest billion, you know, they don't care. 50 million here, who cares? Uh, well, let's think about this. So, uh, this is actually an infinite loop, by the way. <laughs> so this is a infinite loop. Do you see why? First time through the loop, i is zero. Then i is equal to i times two, which is zero. Then i is equal to i times two, which is zero. Then i is equal to i times zero, which is zero. It's an infinite loop. So let's let's fix this, let's, let's fix this, there you go. Now, think about this. Every time we double the size of the vector, this loop will run one more time, right? So if, if it ran uh, 10 times for n is equal to 1,000, if you change n to be 2,000, it'll run one more loop iteration. So this, this relationship is called log n, which means for every doubling of n, we do one more loop iteration. And that's why log n is so fast. Okay, it's so fast because every time you double the entire problem size, you do one more step. So you go from 1,000 to 2,000. Okay, one more step. You go from 2,000 to 4,000 in the vector. All right, one more step. You go from 4,000 to 8,000. All right, one more step. So. This is a classic order log in loop. And so the, the key thing to pay attention to here is the plus plus or the times equals two. If you see a times equals two, it's going to be log in when you see that on a competency exam. If it's plus plus, this loop is order in. Okay. All right. So cool. So yeah, that's that's important. All right. So let's talk about these these BST things. So we insert inserting into a BST is order 
log in. It's fast. Race. Deleting. Order. Log in. Counting. Order. Log in. Uh, yeah. Search. Order. Log in. Yeah. Run it. Ten. 10, 10, 10, 10, 20, 30. Please enter a number to be deleted. 20, is 20 in there? No. Okay, 10, 10, 10, 10. Number to be deleted, 12. Number to be searched for, 10. 10 is in there one time. Do you see that? Even though I added 10 four times, the count said there's only one. Okay. And uh, so in this case, you could just use bst. Dot Contains contains returns true or false. Is it in the is it in the set? For a set though, count is essentially the same thing because it's either one or zero. Now, if you did a multi-set, if you did a multi-set, then you can have duplicates. So. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 20, 30, 0. So if you erase 10 from it, it erases all of them. Okay. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 20, 30, 10. There's five of them. So that's the difference between a set and a multi-set. Multi-set allows duplicates, and it counts how many duplicates you have. So it just depends what you need. Sometimes you want duplicates, you want count them. Sometimes you don't. It just depends on your application. Um, when do you need i times equals 2 in the for loop? Um, for example, doing binary search, if you have a, um, if you have a uh, sorted array and you want to um, go halfway each time, you're going to have things like i is equal i plus some number divided by 2. And um, if you have a heap in array format, a lot of times you'll double your current value and then add 1 to it or add 2 to it. Um, yeah, anytime you see something like that, it, it's going to be a log, a login of some sort. Okay, uh, so yeah, insert, search, delete, order, login. Pretty easy to code, I think, right? Like, insert to insert, erase to delete, count or contains or find if you want. Um, find returns an iterator. And it points at bst.end and is not equal to bst.end. It returns bst.end if it can't find it. So find returns a pointer, an iterator at the element you're looking for, or it returns end if it can't find it. So lots of ways of doing the same thing. 10, 20, 30. 30 is deleted. Let's get your 20. It's in there. Okay. Okay. Understand? Mr. Beast. You understand? Like it's it's a pretty pretty useful data structure. Um, like if you just want to keep track of, like let's say you're doing EU4 and I give you a restriction that you cannot ever enter a province that has been entered before. What I would do is make a set and every time somebody adds a province, I just put that string into the set. And then every time somebody types in a province, I check to see if the new province is in the set already, if it is, error. Sorry, you've added Paris twice, whatever, kill. So um, for things like that, like, hey, have I seen this before? Write it down, you know. Mm -hmm. We'll do maps some other time. Maps are related to sets. Um, basically, you can map between one thing and another thing, like the days, uh, you know, the month, the name of a month, and the days of the month, a person's name and their address, things like that. But dictionaries in Python. But that's not our topic for today. Our topic for today is binary trees. So I put together a little presentation on the subject. So uh, among other things, I do kind of nerdy stuff. Um, and uh, I did, uh, it's not last year. This is, SCA. Okay. Um, yeah, I do board games. Yeah, let's delete that. We don't need you. Um, 
We don't have midterms anymore. We have competence exams now. Okay. So uh, I do SCA and I do D and D and things like that. And so. A binary tree is just a set. The set, the set class in the standard library is basically a BSD. Yeah. This music's from uh, Daggerfall. If you want, if you're curious. Okay. So um, this is a puzzle in an actual published uh, game that I wrote. Um, I've published probably twenty or thirty different Dungeons and Dragons games over the years, and. Uh, this one was written in about 2000 uh, for Wizards of the Coast, and uh, basically, it's it's a this is an adaptation of the puzzle from from my game. So, uh, uh, Rodriguez Cruz, uh, you are up first. You are in a dungeon. The only way out is barred. In Dwarvish, it says, "Find the E X I T. Find the exit." Okay, and in front of you are two two doors. Do you take the door that says M, or do you take the door that says N? Lorenzo. M, very good. On this door is the letter G. Do you go to the left, or do you go to the right? You die. Okay, next up is Jensen. Find the exit, Jensen. Left or right? An axe just chopped your, your friend in half. Jensen, do you take the M door or the N door? M, very good. On the floor is the letter G. Do you go left or do you go right? Left, okay. On the floor is the letter D. Do you go left or do you go right? Right, very good. On the floor is the letter F. Do you go left or do you go right? Left, very good. So Jensen has figured out the puzzle. And uh, you find the letter E, you push it, you walk back, and you find one of the doors, uh, one of the bars has opened. All right, next up is Portnoff. Portnoff, find the exit. Do you go left or do you go right? Very good. On the floor is the letter T. Do you go left or right? Right. Okay. Good. You don't die. Oh, there it is. You found the X. You push its button and you hear another door retract. Next up is Lopez. Lopez, find the exit. Do you go left or right? Left. Very good. On the floor is the letter G. Do you go left or right? You die. Okay. Next up is Hesterberg. Hesterberg, do you go left or right? Left. Okay. On the floor is the letter G. You find the severed body of your friend in front of the left door. Right, okay. On the floor is the letter J. Do you go left or do you go right? You get you get the puzzle now? You go left, good. That has the eye, you press it. Alright, so Romero, you're up now. Left or right? Find the exit. Right, very good. And there you go, there's the T. Okay. So uh, you escape right before the ball rock eats you. Full XP and gold for everybody except for those of you that died. So uh, this was a puzzle that I put into a, a, a game that I wrote. And uh, most of the time when I run it, like people like were kind of like walking around, like figuring it out, and they're like, oh, it's all just alphabetized. It's just an alphabetical thing. You know, to the left is, you know, A, and to the right is Z. Um, but I had one guy, he was looking, and he's like, wait a second, that's a binary tree. And I'm like, yeah, you got me, I'm a computer science major. He's like, you can't put, you can't put binary trees into Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, why not? It's a, it's a puzzle. It's a trap. You know, whatever. It's, there's nothing computer related in this. It's just a puzzle. You know, people have been alphabetizing things for years. You know, he's like, ah, no, it's too. Ah, ah. <laughs> so, um, uh, a friend of mine actually just uh, re-released it. He, um, um, I, I gave him a copy of my game, and he updated it for fifth edition, and it's up on RPG now or, or whatever. 
I don't get any proceeds from this. Ah, tail of two towers. Hmm, why is it not finding that? And he was actually a school psychologist. Uh, why is it not finding it? There we, there we go. Yeah. So uh, that is uh, he was. Uh, I I used to run the D and D at the Crazy Squirrel here in town, and uh, I turned it over to him. So uh, yeah, basically uh, it was uh, a game that I wrote, and then I gave it to him, and he he updated it. And, Sold, sold pretty well, I think. Sell, best seller, silver. Yeah. So, JJ, yeah, he was a, he was a school psychologist at our college, and I played D D with him first, and he just happened to work at our college for a year, and now he's in Michigan or something. Yeah. Um, computer science is too nerdy for D D. Yeah, I know, right? Like, there's no computers in this, you know? Like, come on. I just thought to make a good, good puzzle. So, this is something called a binary tree. So, a binary tree. Uh, is you can think of it like a linked list. You can think of it as a linked list, except instead of a person just having one next pointer, they have two, one left and one right. And so this is the first data structure we've learned that isn't like one dimensional. Like basically everything we've learned, like vectors are 1D by definition. We haven't learned hash tables yet. Stacks, queues, linked lists, they're all kind of one dimensional growing data structures. A binary tree is, it, it grows in two directions. It grows, it grows left and it grows right. So uh, some terminology, the root of a tree is in the air. I don't know why computer science people draw the roots on top and the leaves on the bottom. You got me. I, I can't explain it to you. It's just tradition. The root's always on top. And so for any given node, like node A here, it's got a parent, one parent, and it has either zero, one, or two children. So your, uh, your typical node is gonna have a left pointer and a right pointer, the default to null. And if there's something there, it's not null. Okay, and these are called the children of A, and that's a grandchild of A. So the, uh, the benefit of a binary tree is that if it's balanced, like this one is, you can find any element in the tree in order log in time, okay? So this tree has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 32 elements, but if you go down the tree, you can find anything in five steps or less. It's a, it's a log in relationship. So despite there being 32 elements in this tree, you can find any of them in five steps or less. And the reason why you can do that is because there is a um, class invariant for a binary tree that turns into something called a binary search tree or a binary sorted tree, I've heard some people call it. Um, code Zeta from scratch. Yeah, it's funny. And this is the property. This is this is the invariant that must hold to make a binary tree a BST, a binary search tree. And that is, this is the rule. Everybody to my left is smaller than me. Everybody to my right is bigger than me. That is the invariant that must be true. Okay. So, and it, and it applies recursively, no matter where you are on the tree. If you're at 65, you can see everybody within the right subtree is bigger than 65. If you're at 15, everybody to the left is smaller. Everybody to the right is bigger. If you're at the root, you can see everybody in the left subtree here is smaller than 27. Everybody to the right is bigger than 27. And these are null pointers, right? Uh, now, a problem with binary trees is that if you just insert the numbers like, if insert the numbers one to six, you'll end up getting something that looks a hell of a lot like a linked list. So, um, yeah, so this is a problem, right? Because you've just made a linked list with more steps, right? Um, you've got all these left pointers here that are being absolutely not used for anything whatsoever. Now, um, we're not going to write a balanced binary tree in this class. That is beyond the scope of this class. It is a traditional junior level data structure topic you learned about 
red black trees and AVL trees and things like that at the junior level. We're not going to do balanced trees in this class. If you want a balanced binary search tree in this class, I have good news for you. It's called set. <laughs> okay, so if you want to make a balanced, guaranteed, always balanced tree, there you go. That's set. It's a, bi it's a binary search tree. So uh, for this class, though, we're going to be just making a plain Jane, plain ordinary uh, tree. And if you make it unbalanced, then it's unbalanced. So the running time of an unbalanced tree is not good, right? What, what do you think the running time is? Like if you, if you wanted to find six here, how many steps do you think it'll take to get from root to six? What's the big O? Not in 26 or 45. Nope. Nope. Balanced binary trees are a junior level topic. I do not teach it at our college. I used to TA for the junior level class, and I, I there was a point in time where I could write these things are called like red black trees. I actually wrote red black trees so many times in my tutorial sections that I it was like I could just spit it out, you know, like like that. Uh, nowadays though, I just use the set class. <laughs> it's easier. So if I wanted to search for six, order into the sixth power? No, 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 no. But it's six steps, right? One, two, three, four, right? So in a in a uh, in a unbalanced tree, um, it's not got it does not have good performance. So an unbalanced tree has order in, insert, search, and delete. not good. It's like a linked list. It really is. So, yeah. So the, the binary tree we're going to make for the next homework assignment, which will be due next Friday, so you're going to have 11 days to do it. I've already pushed it out for you. Uh, you're just going to make a very simple unbalanced tree. And it, it's going to be unbalanced for a reason. If you, if you were to rebalance it, it would actually break the program. So you can't use the STL actually on this one. You have to make your own. It's deliberately unbalanced. So, um, yeah, so unbalanced trees, yeah, we, there's really no point to them. Um, for a balanced tree, it's got really good performance. It's order log n, insert, search, and delete. It's really good. There's only one data structure faster than it, and the data structure that's faster than it is something called a hash table. Hash them up, right? And hash tables we'll be talking about later in the semester. We're not really supposed to talk about them in this class. It's considered a more advanced subject than first years are capable of learning, but um, they're so useful, I teach them anyway. Okay. Yeah, the height of the tree, right? The height of the tree is the order of all the operations. Okay, so let's uh, switch over into uh, the coding side of things. Do, do you guys understand this conceptually? Like. Um, um, like, if I was going to insert, uh, if I was going to insert the number three and a half, let's say this isn't integers, they're, they're floats. If I was going to insert three and a half, here's how it works. Like, I want to insert 3.5. So you start at the root. Nope, it's going to erase that. No, maybe not. No, nope, there it is, it erased. Okay, so this is the root. So you start at the root. Okay, and you say, is 3.5 smaller than four or bigger than four? What do you guys think? It's 3.5 smaller than four or bigger than four? It's smaller. So we check to see if there's somebody to the left of four. If there is, okay. So we start with temp equal to root, and now temp points at temp points to left. And then we say, what's bigger, 3.5 or two? What do you think? Who's bigger, 3.5 or two? 3.5, so we go to the right. So if 3.5 is smaller than our current node, we go left. If it's bigger than our current node, we go right. Is 3.5 smaller or bigger than three? Bigger, okay? And so if we were doing an insert, we would now be like, oh, there's a null pointer there. There's a spot available, let's put it in. And that is where 3.5 will go. If you're doing search, you would just go there and be like, uh, there's nothing there, return false. It's not, it's not in the data structure, okay? And so basically search and insert are pretty much identical. Um, they really are. Um, 
The only difference is insert will actually call new and put something in there. Search will just be like, uh, yeah, there's nothing there. Return false. Or, oh, I found it. Return true. That's really the only difference. And I'm going to give you a working uh, implementation of it in the next 10 minutes. Don't save. Actually, I should have saved that, shouldn't I? No. All right. So there can only be one of each number. Depends. What do you want? <laughs> Depends what you want. So, uh, do you want to make a set or do you want to make a multi set? It's just, it, it depends. Sometimes you want to have duplicates, sometimes you don't. Oftentimes, when you do a binary search tree, you just discard a duplicate. Key shows a delete as well, not today. And your homework doesn't require delete. Delete's the hard part. So, you don't have to do it. <laughs> okay, so let me show you something cool here. Let me show you something cool. So, struct node. And this will have, let's make a binary search tree of ints or something. Node pointer left, node pointer right. Okay, there you go. Here's the BSD. Looks pretty similar to a linked list, right? Except instead of prev and next, we've got left child, right child. Make sense? Put in some uh, initializers in here. Null putter. Okay, so instead of hedge, you have root. Yeah, so this is like each individual node in a binary search tree is, is a binary search tree. It's a recursive data structure. Uh, are the nodes next to each other or is it spread out like a linked list? They're spread out. They're uh, just randomly in memory. So you don't have the memory locality of like a vector. Um, although, there is a way of storing binary search trees in an array. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. So watch this, watch this. Class, class, tree. What? What just happened here? What's up, dog? I heard you liked classes. So I put a class in your class you can have class in your class. Okay. Class inside of a class. And it's in the private structure, so nobody actually knows about node at all. Only the tree class does. And so I'm going to have a node pointer here called root, and root is going to default to a null pointer. And that's it. So we're going to have a tree constructor that does absolutely nothing. <laughs> we have a tree destructor that We'll worry about some other time. <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about that right now. We'll just leak memory. Who cares? All right. Uh, <laughs> classy. Yeah. So you can actually put a class definition inside of a class. And so this class can use the node pointer class, but nobody, main doesn't know anything about it. Main knows nothing about how this tree class is actually implemented. All you need to know for main is what's in the public interface. And the public interface is going to have insert search and delete okay that's it uh, I probably shouldn't call it delete uh, Okay, so that's our interface, insert, search, and race. Uh, rather than using the set class, we'll make the tree class, but yeah, you know, basically it's gonna have the same same idea. Uh, why is root not nude? Because uh, root defaults to null. If you have uh, the invariant, um, invariant root points to the top of the tree, or is null if the tree is empty. Invariant number one, invariant number two, everyone to the left of a node is smaller than the node, vice versa, right. Yep. So, that makes sense? Now, let's say we've got an empty tree. 
and we insert 50. What's going to happen is we have to new the head or, or, or the root is what we call it when it's a binary search tree, right? So let's go insert. So we'll say if uh, if root is null, you have to special case that, right? You have to you know always always check to make sure your pointer is null, null whenever you work with anything. So if the pointer is null, then we just say root is equal to new no, new node passing in data. And yeah, that's it. Okay. There you go, new tree. So if uh, the tree was empty before, uh, the tree now has a single node in it whose value is 50 or whatever it is that we passed in. If we get past that point, now we know there is at least one element in the tree. So we'll say node pointer temp is root. And now we are gonna do tree traversal, yay! Tree traversal. Remember how important linked list traversal was? How many times that cropped up over and over again for int do, 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 for linked list node tip, 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 right? Now we're gonna do tree traversal. Okay. You ready for this? So we're inserting a new element into the tree. So let's put up a diagram or something. I don't know. So temp is going to start off pointing to root, like let's say 27 here. Now let's say we're inserting uh, 10. What's going to happen is we're going to be like, okay, 10 is smaller than 27. So we're going to say temp equals temp points to left. And now temp's pointing here. Oh, 10 is smaller than 26. Temp equals temp points to left. Oh, 10 is smaller than 15. Temp equals temp points to left. Oh, temp is bigger than 10. Temp, oh, whoa, 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 we have a null pointer. Here's the spot. And then 10 will be inserted right here. Let me show you what that looks like in code. Whatever, I can, like snap this over. So here we go. So uh, first of all, we checked for an exact match. If we insert 27 into this tree and 27 already exists, we just return. So if uh, data, the data we're inserting equals temp points to data, uh, just return. Duplicate. Dot. Throw it away. Okay. If the data we're looking for is less than the value that we're currently, like let's say temp is pointing here, right? 58. And we're trying to insert 40. 40 is less than 58, so we're gonna go to the left. So if the data is to the left, there's two possibilities. Either there's a kid there already, or it's open. If it's open, we put the data there. If there's a kid there, we move the pointer to that location and repeat. Okay. So if uh, 10 points to data, so if uh, there's nobody there, then we insert the data there. Uh, temp, uh, temp points left. So if we're smaller than the current node, we're inserting 10 and 10 smaller than 27. We check to see if there's a left kid. If there's a left kid, we move to the left. If there's not a left kid, like we're down here or something, then we new the data. So we say temp points to left equals new node data and we're done. Otherwise, temp equals temp points to left. And then we just have to do the opposite for to the right. So five. And there we go. This is a fully functional, I haven't tested yet, I'm sure it's completely correct. This is a fully functional insert function. Okay. You can you you can use return to exit avoid function. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm not returning five or returning something. Return just quits out of avoid function without returning anything. Yeah, it's an easy, easy escape. If I wanted to, I could have done break. Break would uh in the loop, and since the loop's at the last thing, the function, um, that would also exit, but return is the correct thing here. Um, any questions about this? And search is gonna be very similar to this, right? Hurt your brain, Jensen? Let's, uh, 
let's uh, let's run through the uh, let's run through the example. Jensen, give me a number to insert into this tree. Seventy. Okay. So when we start off, temp is equal to root. Right. Now it's this line right here. Temp equals root. Now uh, root root already exists, so we skip over that. So temp equals root. All right. So is 70, 70 is the number we're inserting, is 70 equal to 27, Jensen? No. So is 70 less than, uh, is 70 less than 27? 10 points to data is the, the value there currently. No. So then we're gonna go to the right. So does it have a right child? Does a right child exist? Yes. So if a right child exists, then we just move down to the right. So temp is now pointing at this one. And we repeat. Does 70 equal 58? No. Is 70 smaller than or greater than 58? It's greater than. Does it have a kid already? Yes. So now temp equals temp points to right. Rinse and repeat. Does 70 equal 65? No. Is it bigger or smaller than 65? It's bigger. Temp equals temp points to right. Yeah. Rinse and repeat. Does 70 equal 74? No. Okay, 70 is smaller than 74. All right, so it's this branch. 70 is the number we're inserting. 74 is the current value we're kind of looking at here. Is our left child null? That's what this means. Is, if the left child, I, I can write this out in, if the left pointer is null. If that helps you understand what's going on here. So if the left child of this guy is null, which it is, okay, then we execute this. So this guy's left pointer, this guy's left pointer is equal to new node data. So it creates a new node whose value is 70. This guy points at the new guy. This guy's left pointer is null. This guy's right pointer is null. And that's how you grow a tree. If there's something already at that spot, then you move the pointer to that spot and repeat. Right, that's what we were doing kind of down here. Not a, not a null pointer, not a null pointer, not a null pointer. The pointer, like if, if we were inserting 72, let's say. It would go to the right, go to the right, go to the right, go to the left, and then it would be like, oh, go to the, oh, no, 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 that's null. And then 72 would come in here. So it, it runs to the right, runs to the left, until it encounters an open spot, and then it inserts into that open spot. Lopez, does that make sense? You just keep moving right every time you're bigger than the current. Move to the left every time you're smaller than the current. You keep doing that until you either find it already, right? If, if you if it's already in there, you just quit. No duplicates allowed. Or you get to a null pointer. Once you find a null pointer, that's your spot, and you put the thing in the spot, and you're done. Okay. And our code does not guarantee a balanced tree. <laughs> Uh, there, there are some really clever algorithms to balance trees. Uh, they do things like rotations where they rotate, like if it's unbalanced, it'll do a left rotate and, or a right rotate, depending on which way it needs to be balanced. And the pointer, there's like a pointer shuffle that goes along with it to kind of keep it balanced. But like I said, that's junior level computer science. You don't have to worry about it for now. Okay. So take a look at Dungeon Delve. It's, um, basically the puzzle we did earlier today. Uh, this code here is basically uh, the solution for the thing. Uh, you're gonna you, you're gonna have to adapt it a little bit. Um, search, you know, you have to return true or false, you know. And I think uh, for your assignment, as you search, you actually print out go left, I'm moving left, I'm moving right, as you kind of go down the tree. Does the root matter in optimization if your root is 1 billion? Yeah, like, th that's what I mean. Like, when you when you write a balanced tree, you kind of conceptually keep track of how many people you have in your right tree, how many you have in your left tree, and if they get unbalanced, then you do a rotation, and you pull people from the heavy side to the lighter side. You kind of do this rotation kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. By default, if you pass a, a binary tree, a, just a sorted array of numbers, it'll become very unbalanced, right? If you just pass it one, two, three, four, five, six, it'll add. Yeah. 
doesn't balancing like that take more than order log in? No, because it, it's 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 kind of a clever clever trick with pointers. You can kind of move the point. You can do this like pointer shuffle thing, but it's constant running time. You don't actually have to touch the whole tree. What you do is like um, like what you do would be like um, you do this three points to two points to one points to four points to five points to six kind of kind of thing where you, you, you go like this with the pointers and like this might be unbalanced and so what happens is that this moves down here five comes up here and six comes up here and they end up with one two three four five six and so you can do these rotations that don't have to touch the whole tree they're constant running time kind of thing like I said, junior level computer science. Don't don't worry about it for now. If you want to balance tree, use the set class. Call it a day. Right. Yeah, you'll get to write them. <laughs> you will get to write these in junior level, but yeah, plenty of time to get get good before then. And trust me, even for juniors, it's um, I, I helped a lot of people write those trees back in the day. It's, um, it's an experience. <laughs> a lot of pointers. I view pointers in your future. Okay, right, that's our class for today. Again, no live lecture on Wednesday and Friday. I will put up um, pre-recorded lectures for all. You'll have some quizzes to do in the meantime. Uh, get EU4 done by tomorrow. Bridges Earthquake by Friday. Get Dungeon Delve done by next Friday. And there's Zybooks. Okay, so you should have plenty of stuff to keep you entertained. And uh, I can't promise I'll be available, so I'm going to be over, you know, three time zones away you know, at a conference and stuff. But I'll, I'll try to answer questions. So, and uh, I can put up this code for you if you want. CC. Oh, I already have the BSD. What is? Maybe that one's better. Let's find out. Uh, ooh. Yeah, that's actually got quite. Similar to the one that we did last, uh, last year. When we yeah. Did yeah, that's actually pretty much a full BSD implementation there. So, take a look at it. Yeah, make it work. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you in a week.